Hello, scholars. Take a look at the text on the screen here and see if you can read it. I'll give you five seconds. It's not so easy to get through, right? And yet, if you were an early Greek reader or writer, this is what your text would have looked like. There would have been all capital letters, no spaces between words, and no little punctuation marks to separate out the end of sentences or the pauses between parts within a sentence. Now you've got the benefit of hindsight. You know that text can be easier to read than what you see on the screen. What would be the first change you would suggest to those Greek writers that they make? Surprisingly, in fact, the first sort of uh, little element that was added for readability was a paragraph marker. So para means beside and graphing is to write. So they'd make little marks beside the text to indicate that there was a shift between one big idea and another big idea. And I guess that makes sense if you're a speaker, if you're going to try and change your tone of voice between sections of, of your ideas, then it'd be nice to have the place pointing out whether where that shift was gonna happen. Now, there were various little marks that were used to mark paragraphs. The one on the, the screen you see there in red is the Pilcro, and I think that became the most popular. You can still see it in Microsoft Word today. Now, eventually what happened when the printing press came along was that the, the typesetters, the people setting up the page for printing would, would push over the text a little bit to leave a space for other people to come along and add this little paragraph mark in and you know make it all pretty in red. But eventually they had so many texts that people stopped adding in the little pilcrows. And so readers simply got used to seeing the text push over the indenting and recognizing that that was a paragraph. Now today, if you read online, if well, you read a book, you'll still see indenting, but if you read online, you're more likely to see spaces between paragraphs that just displays a little more reliably on a screen than indenting the text does. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a paragraph break in here. All right, now what do you think the next step was? Well, if we go to the Library of Alexandria in Egypt, in the third century BC, the head librarian Aristophanes was irritated with all these texts that were so hard to get through. And he suggested a system of punctuation that involved little dots, little punctus. So you'd have a high dot or a middle dot or a low dot, and those would indicate whether we had a short or a medium or a long pause. So we have the birth of punctuation. Now what you have to understand though, is that the Greeks and the, and the Romans were, were not readers, they were speakers. Public speaking was very valued as an art. And the text on the page was there merely to remind the speaker of what he or he was going to say. There was no expectation that you would be able to read through that text at, on a first reading and be able to understand it the way we expect to sit down and be able to read a text today. And the Romans who kind of replaced the Greeks uh, felt there was no need for these little punctuation marks. And I, I suppose you can see the logic. If you're someone who's gonna make a speech and you're gonna add in all your own emphases and stuff, maybe you're like, hey, I don't need someone to adding in little extra dots into my writing telling me where I should pause. I can figure that out myself. At any rate, what it took was a writing culture rather than a speaking culture to really get punctuation going. And that writing culture was Christianity. So it's a, a Christian Archbishop, Isidore of Seville in Spain, who eventually updates Aristophanes system. So it's a little more logic here. The short, short pause mark is on the bottom, medium pause mark is in the middle and the long pause mark is up top. We have punctuation sort of getting going again. I'm gonna add just some of, some of our standard punctuation marks today into this, which would help a bit if I gave you time to read through it, which I'm not, because I'm moving on. Now, it still looks a little hard to get through, and imagine, if you will, that it was actually written in Latin. And you have kind of the situation of some of the Scottish and Irish monks who were supposed to read these Latin texts in church, but who were maybe not so familiar with Latin. Now, if you're not familiar with Latin and you're trying to pry apart these words, um, it would be a pretty tough challenge. So it's these monks that said, hey, let's put spaces between words. Now, I'll point out that when we talk, we really don't put spaces between words. So to the first writers, that wasn't an obvious thing to do. Still, it seems like a pretty obvious and certainly beneficial change. So here's our text again, this time with spaces. Looks much better, right? So we've got the original punctus of Aristophanes. We've got an updated system. We've got Irish and Scottish monks adding spaces. Then Charlemagne commissions a monk to come up with a, a new alphabet, and then we get lowercase letters. And at this point, we have lots of writers experimenting with different punctuation marks. Those writers came up with different marks. For example, a mark that looked like a semicolon or sort of prototype of the question mark. There was an Italian writer who suggested a system of dashes and slashes. 
But something happened that caused all of these variable marks to sort of coalesce into the marks that we recognize today. And that was the invention of the printing press. Now think about it, as a writer, you can put whatever marks you want on the page. As a printing press, once you've got that little piece made out of metal, um, you're not going to change it. And the, the text using particular marks is going to be sent to thousands of people. Again, you can see how within 50 years or so, punctuation sort of became standardized. So let's look back at our text here. We've got capital letters, lowercase letters. We've got spaces between our words. And then we've got those wonderful little marks that separate out the parts, tell us when to stop, tell us when to pause. You can read this at a glance. You can understand what it says. It's a vast improvement over the first text that I showed you. Now these are the standard marks that we use today. There have been other marks that have been suggested or attempted along the way. For example, there's the asterism and there's the interrobang. And we've also got emojis today, which is kind of like a whole new form of punctuation. Super exciting, right? But we'll be focusing on the basic standard marks in this class. Feel free to use emojis if you want, right? Now, as you consider this first version of the text with the text as it's written today, let me ask you this question. What's the function of punctuation? Now you might point out it separates one sentence from another. You might say that it marks grammatical boundaries within sentences. You might point out that it allows us to understand text on a first read through. And that it allows us to understand how text should be read aloud, whether we've got a question or we've got an exclamation. Okay, it also adds shades of meaning to certain words. For example, if you say, my friend started dating my boyfriend, the quotation marks uh, take the word friend and give it a slightly different meaning there. Now, a big principle I'd like you to come away with here is that the punctuation marks we use today work as a system of pauses. They tell us when to pause, how long to pause, and what kind of a pause it is. They're not just random marks that exist in isolation. It might be useful to think of this as, as rests in music. I've got an eighth rest, a quarter rest, I've got a half rest, a whole rest. Now, if I play my music fast, each of these pauses will be shorter. If I play my music slowly, each of these pauses will end up longer, but they're always gonna have a certain relationship to each other. Again, it's a system of pauses, not just random things that exist in isolation. So if we take our big five punctuation marks here and the option of not having punctuation at all, so you can put these in order from longest pause to shortest pause. If we're thinking about the longest pause, I'm guessing you would put the period Okay, that's a nice strong punctuation mark, strong enough to stop a sentence. And in Britain, they call them full stops. Now we could add the other end marks there, like a question mark or an exclamation point, even an ellipsis, which in dialogue can make a sentence sort of trail off and stop, right? But mostly I'll just talk about periods. If we think about the least pause, well, that'd be a lack of punctuation, right? And then if we think about a nice short pause, we're probably thinking the comma. That's that nice little mid-sentence pause. Not strong enough to stop a sentence, okay, but good for separating out parts within a sentence. Then we've got the middle marks, the medium pauses, and you can put those in whatever order you want. There's the semicolon, the colon, and the dash. And the semicolon to me feels very neutral. Um, other people may think of it as being slightly anticipatory. The colon says, hey, there's something else coming up here. And the dash does that, but it does that with emphasis. You can use that to emphasize things. Now it's these middle marks that typically students are a little less familiar with, and we'll spend some time on each of those. If you think about the job that each of these marks do, the long pause, the period separates independent clauses. It separates sentences. The medium pauses, there's some overlap here. They can separate independent clauses from each other. You can put these middle marks between two sentences but they can also separate an independent clause from the other part, the other elements from the sentence, like a dependent clause or a prepositional phrase, things like that. Now the comma, we don't use that to separate full sentences. It doesn't sit between independent clauses, but it can separate out the little parts within a sentence. And then again, we're gonna, we're gonna not use a part, a pause, when we're talking about the little parts within a sentence. If we know how the different part punctuation marks function, then we know what our options are when it comes to certain sentence patterns. In this case, we've got an independent clause and an independent clause. Lori's cheeks turned red. She had just seen Johnny. Both of those things could stand alone as a sentence. So one mark we might be put between them is simply to put a period, right? Stop the first sentence, then start the next. 
But we know that those middle marks also fit between sentences. So if we want to show kind of relationship between these two sentences, pull them just a little bit closer together, we could use a semicolon. Semicolon works like a period. How does a semicolon work? Like a period. Now we could also use a colon if we want to give the sense that Lori's cheeks turn red and here's why she had just seen Johnny. So the colon again says there's something coming up here that's going to explain what just what I just said. We could also use a dash if we really want to emphasize the fact that she had just seen Johnny. Laura's cheeks turned red. She had just seen Donny, Johnny. So the dash, again, hooks together two sentences and gives sort of <coughs> emphasis to the second one. Could we put a comma here? Well, commas typically don't sit between full independent clauses. And I think most people would consider this to be an error. It's a comma splice. We don't like these. Okay, commas just do not do the job of sitting between two sentences. Now this is language. Are there exceptions? Yes, there are. As a general rule though, don't try to hook two sentences together with a comma. Let's try another pattern. Johnny apologized after he thought good and hard. I've got an independent clause, Johnny apologized. That could be a sentence on his own, right? After he thought good and hard is a dependent clause and it can't be a sentence on its own and be grammatically complete. There's that sense of incompleteness there, right? After he thought good and hard, so what could I put between a full independent clause and then a smaller sentence part? Well, I could put nothing. Johnny apologized after he thought good and hard. And in that case, that option works just great. I could put a comma here if I want just a little bit of emphasis on the, on the second part of that sentence, right? Johnny apologized after he thought good and hard. Now, if I really wanted to emphasize that, that little tail bit there, I could use a dash to tack it on. So again, a dash can sit between an independent clause, what is essentially a full sentence, and then another sentence part. The dash gives emphasis to that second part there. I've got options. Could I put a period here? Typically, no. Typically, periods only sit between two full sentences, two independent clauses. But could I make an exception if I really want to emphasize that second part there? I mean, I could, and that's where language has a little bit of flexibility. So let me add this other principle here to the things I'd like to emphasize. There are some pretty standard rules regarding how these marks are used. As a writer, you've got a little bit of flexibility. Okay, but in, the cla in this class, mostly I'm just going to try and emphasize the standard rules because it, it typically helps to know the rules before you try and break them. Now, if you understand that punctuation is a system, then you know that a lot of times getting the right punctuation mark is a function of these are either raising the punctuation going to a stronger mark or lowering it by going to a weaker mark or a mark that's a, a smaller pause. So take a look here. I had always wanted a pet fish goal that seemed especially fine. Well, something's not right there, right? I've got to run. I've got two sentences that have been kind of smashed together. Here's a case where I've got no punctuation and I need to raise the level. And in fact, in this case, I need to raise the level probably to a period. Although, you know, I could use a semicolon or something. Now, how about in this case? The men were running things badly. That sentence works just fine as is. I can read it without any pauses in there. There's no grammatical need to add punctuation in there. But if I, as a writer, want to emphasize that last bit, I could add a pause in there. I could raise the punctuation from nothing to a comma. The men were running things badly. Or if I really wanted some emphasis there, I could use a dash. The men were running things badly. Now, sometimes I might need to lower the level of my punctuation. I wanted the cookie that she made. There's zero grammatical reason, or uh, probably even logical reason, to have that, that period there. Periods don't sit in the middle of a sentence the way this one is trying to do. So in this case, I would probably lower it to nothing. Would any other mark work there? I mean, I guess you can make it work, but probably in this case, nothing is going to be the best option. Okay. So we know there's standard rules regarding how these marks are used, but good writers we know use punctuation intelligently to convey meaning and emphasis. Sometimes I can play with those rules a little bit to emphasize something. Now let's take two classic examples here and see if you can add punctuation to convey the correct meaning. How much you punctuate this to take it from a sentence that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to one that makes more sense. How about we try this? Woman, without her, man is nothing. In this case, we've added in the proper pauses to give that sentence a little more sense. Here's another classic. What could you add here to make the sentence make sense? Charles I walked and talked. Half an hour after, his head was cut off. 
So here we're using punctuation. Oh, I love this. What a classic, right? Okay, here we're using punctuation to guide our reader to the, the correct logical meaning of the sentence. Big principles one more time. The punctuation marks we use today work as a system of pauses. There's some pretty standard rules about how these marks are used, and we're going to cover all those standard rules. But you as a writer need to be thoughtful and intelligent about how you use punctuation to convey meaning and to create emphasis. Coming up again, we'll be looking at the medium pauses, semicolons, colons, dashes, going over those. We'll do some comma reviews, and we'll talk a little bit about maybe fragmenting for effect. So you can anticipate lots more fun grammar stuff to come. If you're like totally nerdy like me and you'd like to read a little more on punctuation as a rhetorical tool, I'd recommend this uh, article by John Dawkins. And there's the link where I accessed it. The information about the history of punctuation, I looked at multiple sources, but the two that I use the most are referenced on some of the, the slides early in the, in the video. That's it.